It seems like a pretty reasonable question. If we have two streams, let's say one is at 15 bar and the other one is at 10 bar, and we combine them in a flow system, what happens to the pressure after they mix? It's pretty important to say that we're talking about a flow problem, not a system in which we are allowing the pressures to equalize. I needed the answer to this question in my final year design of my chemical engineering degree. We were going to design some process in which we combine two feed streams, send them to a reactor and produce some sort of desirable product. The interesting part of the assignment was designing the reactor, but I was stumped by a pressure mixing problem way before getting to this point. The assignment gave us the pressures of the two feed streams. Let's say stream A has a pressure of 15 bar and stream B has a pressure of 10 bar. We were able to calculate the flow rate of each stream because we knew exactly how much production rate we wanted. So we would combine them and send them to a reactor. What was the pressure after they mixed? I asked some friends what they thought the answer was, and a few suggested that it was the average pressure of 12 and a half bar. But we know that things flow from a high pressure to a low pressure. If the pressure was 12 and a half, then the 10 bar stream wouldn't flow into it. Okay, so stream A at 15 bar will flow into stream B at 10 bar. So the answer is 10 bar, right? But we had a similar problem. Why would 10 bar flow into 10 bar? The mixing pressure needs to be lower than 10 bar for stream B to flow. So how much lower is it? 9.9 .9 bar? 8 bar? 2 bar? If you try and find the answer to this question on the internet or try look on forums, it's all things like you should use Bernoulli's equation to do a momentum balance or you need to calculate the pipe friction factors to know how much pressure drop you have. And the thing about these answers is they are correct but also a little bit useless because they don't make you feel like you've understood the problem and you're in a position to answer the question. Oh, thanks Fred. In fact, go and ask any engineer what the answer to this problem is, and if they attempt to give you a numerical answer, they're probably incorrect. To help illustrate why, here's a thought experiment. Let's take our two streams and our starting pressures. Throw away the plant that we were designing and cut off the pipe immediately after the mixing point. In other words, simply open it up to the atmosphere and let the streams flow. If we stuck a pressure gauge right at the end of this pipe, we would see that the mixture would be at atmospheric pressure as it spills out onto the ground, was released into the atmosphere. It doesn't make a difference whether the streams are liquid, gas, or a combination of the two. It must leave the pipe at atmospheric pressure. The atmosphere is a large pressure sink, which means that you will not change its pressure by releasing fluid into it. This is also referred to as back pressure. So in other words, assuming we are at sea level, the stream mixture would be approximately one bar absolute or zero gauge pressure at the point at which it leaves the pipe. It doesn't matter how much flow we have of either stream. Now imagine we took the exact same system and installed it on a shallow ocean floor. Assume we are 15 meters below sea level. The absolute pressure on the ocean floor is a combination of atmospheric pressure, the one bar absolute that we used previously, plus the pressure exerted by the height of the water above our installation, which is an additional one and a half bar. In other words, the back pressure onto our system is two and a half bar. So when the two streams mix and flow out into the ocean, they need to be at two and a half bar as they leave the pipe just after mixing. Once again, it doesn't matter what the flow is. I'm unable to change the pressure of the ocean floor by putting more flow through the pipes. If the pressure was less than two and a half bar after they'd mixed, then the ocean water would start running into our pipe because it would be at the higher pressure. Can you see that by simply changing the location of our plant, we've arrived with two identical systems, but two completely different pressures under which they mix? The point is you're unable to give a numerical answer to the problem because it isn't fully defined. You need to know what happens after they mix. Is it connected to a pipeline that's running across the country? Is it connected to another 20 pieces of equipment? Or is it simply open to atmosphere? If two streams originate at two completely different pressures, and they usually do, the point at which they mix has to be at only one pressure, which means by the time the two streams arrive at this point, they need to lose different amounts of pressure so that their pressures are equal by the time they combine. You see, that's the part I didn't understand when I was asking my question and I was designing my plant in the first place. I thought I had to calculate the mixing pressure by using the information that I was given upstream. 
when in actual fact, I was able to choose the pressure at which they mixed. The pressure I select simply needs to be higher than the total expected pressure drop downstream. If it isn't, then I'm going to need a pump or a compressor to overcome that pressure drop. That is the whole point of the design process. My plant doesn't exist yet, so I could pick whether my reactor was going to have a pressure drop of 1 bar or 5 bar. There will be upsides and downsides for either choice. The answer is not fixed and it is up to the person designing the system to choose a reasonable value. Your best bet is to use industry experience and reference text for recommended pressure drops that result in equipment sizes that are economically feasible. If I decided my stream was going to need 5 bar to get the required flow rate through my reactor, then my mixing pressure would need to be at least 5 bar. I would then need to install valves on the feed lines to achieve the pressure drop from 15 bar and 10 bar down to 5 bar. If instead I designed my reactor to have a pressure drop of 1 bar, I would have very different valves giving me different pressure drops than previously to make sure that the streams mix at the pressure of 1 bar. You see, that's the other thing, is we rarely have situations where we have two streams at different pressures combined with open pipelines without anything else in those pipes creating pressure drop. Back to my design problem. Let's assume that my reactor was the only piece of equipment in the plant and I decided that it was going to have a design pressure drop of 5 bar. Let's also assume that I had a customer downstream or another plant downstream that needed a minimum pressure of 2 bar for their plant. Well then I would need 2 bar out of my reactor. This means that I would need an inlet pressure of at least 7 bar. Can you see how these decisions and design considerations are determining the mixing pressure? In fact, you could say the individual upstream pressures are not that important in determining the mixing pressure. They just need to be high enough. So the key takeaway is that if you ever want to know the pressure at a point, you need to know what happens downstream of that point. That's applicable when you have two streams mixing, but it would be just as applicable if you only had one of those streams flowing. The mixing part is just confusing the issue.